The following presentation was recorded by View Digital Media at the inaugural Southeast Linux Fest in Clemson, South Carolina on June 13, 2009. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org. Hey, it's, re it's really great to be here. Uh, I'm Simi Purewall. This is Brian Pitts. Uh, Brian Pitts is, uh, is currently involved with Free IT Athens, so I invited him to come and talk kind of about what Free IT Athens is doing uh, right now. Um, I, one thing I don't want to do is I don't want to give the impression that what we're about to talk about here is something that, that's just going on in, in around the southeast. This is really sort of a, a movement that, that's happening across the country. And in fact, when we started Free IT Athens a few years ago, uh, when we had the idea, we realized there was other organizations doing similar things. And, um, and so, so it's, it seems like it's, it's much bigger than just us. We're going to tell you about three organizations around the Southeast today, primarily because we want to convince you, because, well, we mo know the most about them, but we also want to convince you that this is completely doable on uh, sort of any, any level. But the three organizations that we're going to tell you about kind of have varying, um, uh, uh, or sort of have their own spin on the same idea. So uh, the, it, it, to, to start with what we wanted to do is kind of, kind of, uh, Brian Pitts and I and Kevin Jones, who's, the, who's running the Free Linux PC project, kind of got together and talked a little bit about why we decided to do this. And we, d we came up with some problems in particular that we thought that, that our, our approaches try to solve in some way. So I'm going to talk about a few things right here at the beginning that may seem a little disconnected, but uh, hopefully it'll all come together and, uh, by, by the end. So how many of you guys know about this thing called the GPL? Right, so what, what is the GPL? It's the general public license. Right, the general public license. What does it do? It yeah, it, it guarantees freedoms, right? In some sense, it's like, it's like uh, the Constitution or the Bill of Rights in some ways. So I have some, some questions that, that I just want you to think about for a second. Um, if I don't have access to the computer, do I still have the freedoms that are guaranteed by the GPL? Yes. Yes, Absolutely. Do I have the freedoms guaranteed by the GPL if I don't know how to access, study, or modify the source code? Yes. Technically, I do, right? Technically, I have the ability to do any of these things uh, guar guaranteed by the GPL. But effectively, I don't, right? It's sort of like the same problem as if I ask, do I still have freedom of speech if I don't have a voice? Do, do, I, do I still have freedom of the press if I'm illiterate and I can't write? Right? So technically, we do have freedoms guaranteed by the GPL, but effectively, we don't if we don't have access to a computer and we don't know how to uh, modify the source code. So what we as, as open source advocates, and I, and I think that part of the reason we're all here today is because we have, we, we're, we're partially advocates for open source and free software, we have to ask ourselves, how important are these freedoms to us? Freedom of speech and freedom of the press and things like that are very, very important, and they've been important for a very, very long time. So at this point, it's, it's codified in, in the Constitution, and we spend a lot of time teaching kids and, 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 and society about these freedoms, right? Uh, every kid knows that they have freedom of speech by the time they get to high school and freedom of the press, and they'll, and they'll say that. I mean, even little kids will say, you know, I have freedom of speech. I can say whatever I want. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a common thing that we all are aware of very early on. Unfortunately, it's not true with the freedoms guaranteed by the GPL. So if we think that these are important, we need somebody to be out in the communities teaching these things to kids and to society as a whole as about, um, uh, about the freedoms that are guaranteed by the GPL and what they can do for us, what, how we, we can use them effectively. Uh, so, so yeah, so, so, so basically the point is, is if we're going to believe that these freedoms are really, really important, we need to be the ones doing it because nobody else is going to do it. The education system has enough stuff on their plate already. It, it's going to be us, those of us that are advocates doing it. The other thing I wanted to bring up is that in this day and age, technical skills equals power, right? If we have technical skills, we have power. I think that uh, a lot of times, though, those of us that are involved in the open source movement kind of take for granted some of the technical skills that we do have that not everyone has. For instance, how many of you can easily create an electronic resume? Well, I would hope everyone. I'm, seeing, I'm not seeing all the hands. Yeah, so most of you guys have no problem creating a resume and would never even think twice about it. Not everyone has that power. 
Not everyone is, knows about how to use the internet and can find a job on Craigslist. And in, in this day and age, the, where, where the jobs are few and far between, they need to be able to know how to do that. Um, the internet actually gives us the opportunity to use some of these other freedoms that, that we're talking about, like freedom of speech. We can speak our mind and find an audience. Right? Well, what about the people that don't have access to the internet that, that, that don't know how else to actually uh, speak their mind or find an audience? This is, this is an opportunity to give them that power. But the other thing is that we sometimes take for granted is we have the ability to build, for instance, the next big social media application. So I'm going to tell a quick story. When, when I first started out at Free IT Athens, when we first started our big recycling program, there was a, a gentleman that came in that uh, uh, was really, really excited because we were going to give him a computer after 12 hours of, of community service. And, and Brian will talk a little bit about that in a second. But he uh, wanted to get a laptop for his daughter. And he was, like, he was very excited about getting a laptop for his daughter. So he, he came in, and he was really gung-ho. He was getting into everything. He was wanting to know how everything was working. He was asking us how, uh, uh, how we were doing things on the computer and all these other things. At the end of the 12 hours, he got his laptop. I gave him my phone number, and I was like, you know, if you ever have a problem, just give me a call. And, and, and I want you to uh, uh, you know, feel free to call me, and I'll be, be happy to try to walk you through stuff on the phone. So, so he did it a couple of times. So he called me, and I would walk him through stuff on the phone. But one day I got a phone call from him, and he was calling me with an idea. He was like, and this is an older guy. I mean, he was, he was pretty old. And he, he was telling me about a time that he worked in a grocery store as a clerk, and he had this idea on how to, uh, well, I don't want to give away the idea because he didn't give me permission to. But the point is he had an entrepreneurial idea that was generated by the time he spent with us at Free IT Athens, right? I mean, and this is really sort of exactly what we want to do. We want to show people the power that they have with, the, with, with uh, technology and the way that you can, ways that you can be creative with it. And it's entirely possible that a lot of people just haven't had the opportunity to see that sort of thing. How many of you guys heard of the digital divide? Yeah, the digital divide. It, it, it's sort of the, the idea that, that, that there's this, this, this a global digital divide where a lot of people have access to computers and a lot of people don't. And the ones that don't have access to computers and technology are falling behind. In the United States, we have a digital divide. I don't think that that's very arguable. But there is a common criticism of the digital divide in the United States. Does anybody know what that is? It's that it's temporary, that it's not going to be with us forever in the United States. And in my experience working with the Gussie Green Project, I've found that this is probably the case. The, the, in the, the Gussie Green Project, we've had kids coming into our computer lab and constantly, uh, they are way, way more prepared to be playing with computers than adults. They are not scared of the thing, right? So they're going to grow up, and they're going to be comfortable with technology. They may not have the technology uh, in, their, in their homes like we do, but they're going to be a lot more comfortable with it than, uh, th than the, the current adults are. But we also get the adults. The first class we taught at Gussie Green is a community project. We had somebody come in, and he sat down at the computer for the first time, and he looked down, and he put his hands up, and he looked at me. The keyboard was sitting right in front of him, right? And he was like, I, I had to tell him, it's okay, go ahead, touch it, man. He was, it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt you. And he, he put his hands on the keyboard and he started typing. And we, and we, I, I set up a, a K Touch for him. So K Touch is a typing program where he could practice typing. And, and, he, and he started doing it. And you could sort of see the fear start to melt away. And the more that we taught him about these things, the, the, the more comfortable he got. Who is willing to tell this guy, hey, the digital divide in the United States is temporary, so we shouldn't worry about it? I think we should. I think that we have a, a big opportunity to sort of get out into the community and actually start doing these things. What, what is this picture of? Ubuntu. Ubuntu, right? Ubuntu loves these pictures of diversity, like these pictures of diverse populations using Linux. Is it accurate? What do, the, what do the common Linux users look like? <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's a, it's a, it doesn't look like this, I think. I think that the, 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 we don't have a quite a, a diverse population of Linux users. We also don't have a diverse population of IT workers. How many of you guys work in IT? Right. How many of you guys have a diverse population among your workforce, among your peers that you communicate with on a daily basis? 
Oh, that's great. I'm glad. Well, some people do, but the majority of you don't. I teach computer science. We do not have a diverse population in computer science as a whole in the United States, especially not at College of Charleston. It doesn't seem like we can get females to major in computer science, right? And this has been a major problem for computer science and IT, the IT profession as a whole for quite some time. And, and, and of course, why do you think that is? Does anybody have? That's, a cer that's certainly part of it, absolutely. Recently, though, like probably actually three weeks ago, uh, uh, an AC, uh, the Association for, Communica uh, the Association for Commu Computing Machinery released a report where they had done this long-term study where they were checking to see why, uh, find, trying to find out why females and minorities don't want to go into IT, the IT workforce. And what they found is that the major motivating factors in uh, minority and female participation in, in any discipline is that they, they're drawn to disciplines where they have the opportunity to make some kind of, uh, work in some kind of social or interconnected way. Right? And they do not view information technology and computer science as, as a discipline that will allow them to do that. Right? Is that true? No. Absolutely not. We're, we're tr that's exactly the point that we're trying to make. That we're trying to demonstrate that you can, go, you can learn about IT and then you can go out and work in your community. It's absolutely, without a doubt, a possibility. And, and, and the, the goal being that, 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 that we'll show the, the world that it's possible to change the world through IT and computer science. So th this is the, these are some of the reasons why we think that what we're doing is important. This is why we do it, right? Uh, we've, we've thought a lot about it and we've been doing it for quite some time. Um, but this is a unique opportunity to kind of address all these problems. We can teach adults uh, for workforce development, right? We can teach them basic computer skills that they won't have otherwise. We can share programming skills with kids, because where do kids learn programming? Nowhere. The, the, the most high school, I mean, most K through 12 curriculum in South Carolina, what's the only computing requirement that's required? Typing. Typing is it. The, not even office. Not required for, for uh, K through 12 in South Carolina. Typing is it. Right? Where are they going to learn programming? Well, the schools aren't teaching it. What, I mean, and, and by the time they get to college, if they want to go and do something creative or work on open source software, they don't have, they're scared. They've never done it before. So they don't take the classes and they don't major in computer science. And we see this massive decline in, in our workforce. We can advocate for software freedom, which is something we should be doing anyway. I was really, really happy to see in the keynote today that somebody used the word evangelizing. Because I think that, that I agree that, 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 uh, that, that we need to be evangelizing for open source because nobody is going to do it for us. Microsoft has an army out there of, of, of marketing people that are, that, that, that are doing so much marketing and, and we just don't. So this is another opportunity for us to advocate for this. We can show non-techies that IT is directly related to people by, by, by living by example, by showing that we can go out and work in our communities and do positive things. We can put idle machines back to work. How many of you guys have a computer sitting in your closet that's not doing anything? Yeah, I know. I do too. I had, I had a lot more before I started working with Free IT Athens, right? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. How many of you guys have 10, right? So, so those, those machines could be used. I mean, there's, there's communities that don't have computers. Uh, and last but not least, the volunteers and the, uh, the, volunteers and, and, and the, the, the organizations that we help, they become free software advocates. And that there's nothing better than having, growing our, our community and, and, becoming, and having more people become active and, and, and uh, advocate for the things that we believe in. So Free IT Athens is the first organization that, that we're going to talk about. And I'm going to let Brian uh, talk about this. But, but before we do, I, I'll just tell you a little bit about background. Michael Moore, right here. Uh, Michael Moore and I and one other guy named Michael Luckton were in graduate school at the, uh, well, Michael Luckton wasn't, but we were in graduate school at the University of Georgia and decided, you know, to having these kinds of conversations, we decided, hey, we need this kind of organization in Athens to help with the poverty problem or to, to at least put idle machines back to work. We had all sorts of reasons that we were doing this. And so in 2005, we got together and started doing it and it started out very slow, <laughs> uh, but we, we, we got a lot of work done. We set up an infrastructure, and it's been going to this day. 
Michael left, I think, in 2006. I left in 2007. And Brian and uh, Clint Ricker, who's sitting right there, and a few other folks uh, sort of took it over and have made it an actual major force in the Athens community. And Brian will tell you a little bit more about FreeIT. Yeah, thanks, Simi. So I want to tell you a little bit about what FreeIT is doing right now. Some of our current programs kind of show you what seems to be working in Athens and give you some ideas for what might be useful in your own community. So um, somebody's already given you a bit of background, and we've talked about some of the motivations for it. So I'll move on. And the program that kind of underlies most of the other work we're doing is the recycling program. We try and recruit individuals in the community and businesses in the community to, when they have hardware they're no longer using, um, maybe they've just bought a new computer or maybe it's broken, they don't know how to fix it, to instead of taking it to the landfill to bring it to us and that we can then allow volunteers to take that computer to break, break it apart, to figure out the hardware, what's working, what isn't, rebuild the machine and then load it with the Ubuntu and other free and open source software, and then the, get the computer ready to be put back in the community. So uh, this program really is a great opportunity for volunteers who don't have a lot of experience already with computers because the dedicated experienced staff can walk them through working on the computer, can help them understand the hardware, can teach them about the software. And so by volunteering, they can gain a lot of skills. Now, most of this volunteer work takes place during our open hours. Open hours, we have them two days a week. Right now, Wednesday is from 6 to 8 p.m., and Sunday is from 1 to 5 p.m., and a little second-story room at a little old school building we've been lucky to get access to. And uh, during these open hours, our volunteers can come in and work on processing the computers that have been donated. People who want to donate the computers can come by. They can drop them off. We can give them a receipt so they can get you know, the tax deduction for making the donation. And people who need computer help, maybe they're people who we've given computers to in the past and they're having trouble with the computers, or maybe you know they've got that computer with Windows that they got at Best Buy and it's full of viruses and they'd like to find a better way to use the computer. We're there with our volunteers to help them solve those problems, to help them learn how they need to do something or help them you know, get open source software installed on the computer. Now, People who want to get a computer from us, there's a, a couple different avenues they can pursue. One of those is by volunteering with us for 12 hours, they can earn a computer. And this means essentially they can walk in with maybe no computer experience whatsoever, and at the end of 12 hours, they've been able to build their own computer, they've installed the operating system, they know how the software works, and then they can take it home. And some people who do this will just take the computer home, and that'll be the last we'll ever hear from them. But many other people, as they're doing this, they get excited about the work they're doing. They get excited about what they've learned, and they want to share that with other people. And so they'll stay on and be continuing volunteers. Now, not everyone does have the time to volunteer and get a computer that way. So we do computer sales and grants. Um, for computer sales to individuals, we ask $50 if the computer's being used by an adult or $25 if it's going to be used by a kid. That price is for the complete computer system. We're talking a desktop that's at least Pentium 3, 384 megs of RAM, you know, 10 gig hard drive, sound, video, network card, the keyboard and the mouse, everything you need to have a usable system loaded with Ubuntu, loaded with additional education software and productivity software to make it useful for people. And so individuals can buy those computers. Nonprofit groups, community groups around Athens, they can buy computers too. Or if they like, they can apply to our grant program where they'll explain to us what their information technology needs are and how the computers are going to help them improve a program they offer or offer a new program. And then they can get free hardware if we approve that grant request. One um, new program we started offering is a partnership with the school district. And this has been really uh, huge for us and helped us really expand our impact. Where now the athens Clark County School District, they're on like a three, four year hardware refresh cycle. So when they're ready to replace their machines, instead of just sending them to the state surplus program, where well, they'll probably be bought by some wholesaler and then sold on eBay or something, they give the machines to us, our volunteers prepare them, just like we prepare the other computers I've talked about. And then we work with the family engagement office at the school district to get these computers back out to the families and students who need them the most, 
or to get them to community organizations that are doing work with kids in after-school programs because the school district has a lot of information on families. They know how many kids are in a household. They know if they're on free or reduced lunch. They can survey families and ask them, you know, do you already have a computer in the home already? So this is really helping us to target the services we provide to the population in Athens that needs the help the most. And the, the final main project we work on is training courses. Um, really, if you hand people a computer, yeah, in some aspects you've bridged the digital divide assuming they know how to turn it on, but maybe they won't. Unless you provide the training on how to set up the hardware and how to use the software, giving someone a computer is not that useful. So whenever we're distributing computers, we make sure people go through a basic training course where they understand how the hardware works and how to take care of the computer where we walk them through setting up that initial user account so you know we don't get the phone call saying, hey, I forgot my password. So they understand how to do things like start open office and save a file in Microsoft format to their jump drive so maybe they can take it to work and print it out. Just to try and put some numbers on some of the work we're doing. Um, since we moved into our new space in January, we've had over 35 volunteers active, and they've logged more than 500 volunteer hours. Um, since Free IT was started four years ago, we've helped 24 community organizations by giving them computers and giving them training and tech support. In fact, we've distributed almost 200 computers to organizations. And for individuals, we've distributed more than 1,000 computers. In, in the past nine months, I think we've done around 1,100 computers from the school district, bulk of those going to families with more than one child who didn't already have a computer in the home. And we've really expanded the training programs recently. In the last month, when we've been doing a lot of these laptop distributions with the school district, we've taught 19 different training courses, and we're looking to do even more. So talking about the future and where free IT is going, uh, one thing is we do want to develop much more training. Right now, we're only doing the basic course where people understand how to click around in Ubuntu and they understand how to hook up their computer and use the mouse. But we want to make sure they're able to use the computer to the fullest potential. We want to make sure they understand how to go on Craigslist and search for jobs but not fall for the scams. We want to make sure they understand how to use OpenOffice and how to design their resume. And so we're trying to develop new courses to teach more focused skills and open them up to the public who wants to come to courses and open them up to organizations where their staff might need help building certain skills using the free software. Another area we're expanding into is offering network access to people. The internet is such a crucial avenue for gaining information and for making your voice heard in today's society that if we're distributing a thousand computers but all they can do is type their paper. All they can do is maybe play G-Compree. If they can't access the information online, if parents can't go to, say, the school district's website and look up their kids' grades, they're not able to use these computers to the full potential. They're not, you know, true digital citizens. So what we're trying to do right now is work more with different community centers and community groups around Athens to build community hubs where people can know they can take their computer and they'll be able to get online at this site. And ideally, long term, we want to roll out not just to targeted community centers, but to work with groups and be able to roll out wireless access to entire housing communities. And to do this, we're going to need many more partnerships with other organizations. You know, our biggest successes come when we find other groups like the school district who want to do work in this area that we're working in and can connect with us and we can have a mutually beneficial relationship. So working with the school district has been very helpful, but now we're really looking at working more with groups like the housing authority and the libraries to help um, provide computers and training to you know, their populations and to draw on the skills that their workers have and you know, get help developing these training courses, for instance, to get help um, you know, deploying Wi-Fi networks in a housing project, perhaps. And finally, the last long-term goal we're probably working on is becoming our own independent 501c3. Right now, we're operating under the umbrella of another group in Athens that's 
in a sense, kind of an incubator for nonprofit groups that will take care of the financial work for us and the taxes and let us use their 501c3 status. But we know that if we really want to keep growing and be seen as a le true legitimate organization, that people are going to want us to be our own 501c3 and that that might help us apply for grant funding, which might open up new opportunities of bringing on you know, perhaps some part-time staff to handle some of the organizational work, because right now we're all volunteers, and might help us you know, get an expanded space so that we could accommodate more volunteers working at once and have better computer storage. So that's what we're working on and the direction we're moving in. Thanks, Brian. It's great. The, the, so, so Free IT Athens is, pr is pretty established now. It's been around for about four years. Free Linux PC uh, has been around for about two years. I just recently became involved with Free Linux PC, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on the board of directors now to try to uh, carve out a, a unique path for, for this organization. Um, but basically, the idea was that it was started in, uh, uh, in, in I think, two, late 2006 uh, with the, kind of the same goal in mind as, as Free IT Athens to uh, provide computer access and technology training for low-income families and individuals. Since that time, they've, they're, they're, they've had numerous successes as far as building community labs, uh, doing some training, and offering technology assistance. Um, but the, the, the key thing, I think, that, that, that's changed over time with with Free Linux PC is that uh, their initial goal was to take old computers, put open source software on them, and then hand them to uh, people that would need computers. As Brian stated, that, that model tends to not work very well because when you just hand a computer to somebody without providing training, there's, there's some difficulty in actually uh, th them, them knowing what to do with it. It goes home and it collects dust. So, with that in mind, uh, Free Linux PC's new goal is to start working on uh, building community, community computer labs, uh, preferably across the southeast, pr particularly in rural areas. South Carolina is, has a ton of rural areas where, where it's just absolutely necessary that the, the, the community has some location to go to use the Internet, right? So the... In, in the long term, I guess Free Linux PC is going gonna, is gonna to move back into the idea of giving the computers away, but after they've participated in these community computer labs. Uh, but to date, the, there's been a, they've, they've given away approximately 100 Free Linux PCs, uh, they, and they've built three FLPC labs in low-income daycare centers that are all running Ubuntu uh, with uh, bookmarks already set up on the Internet for, for uh, uh, websites that kids would typically visit. And uh, they, they've also done some work with the Sterling Community Center where they actually have built a, uh, a, uh, a Ubuntu lab running thin clients. So they have a central server and they're running thin clients. And it's, uh, it's going real, very, very well. The future, though, as is, is, is time's going on, one of the things that we're looking at doing with Free Linux PC, and we've already kind of set this up, is, is to let Free Linux PC kind of be a glue for all these organizations that are cropping up all over the country, not just the southeast. So, for instance, uh, Free IT Athens has a ton of knowledge to share about their experiences. We made rookie mistakes at the beginning. Free Linux PC made rookie mistakes at the beginning. Everybody's going to do that. But the goal is to try to minimize these mistakes across the board by sharing what's happened, right? By keeping track of how things are going, to let people know about our failures so they don't repeat them. Right? So in, in, with that in mind, uh, uh, we've set up this uh, website, freelinuxpc.org, where uh, the goal is, of course, to learn, share, and connect. And basically, it's about getting open source software into the community however we can. Right? And so we've got a wiki available. Uh, we, we've set up a, uh, well, Brian actually set up the, the open technology list, which I'll tell you about in a second. And we're trying to sort of coordinate our efforts to some extent. We do not want to be an organization that tells everybody else what they have to do. We want to be an, or an organization that just like connects a lot of these organizations for the reasons that I, I said. We have a wiki set up now, and that, that's something that, that anybody has access to. So if you're interested in doing this, we can talk to you about it afterwards. So. The Gussie Green Community uh, Technology Center, and I misspelled green. It's actually G-R-E-E-N-E. -E -E. But uh, the, the Gussie Green Community Technology Center is another project going on in South Carolina that we're really happy about. And it, again, is a much, it has its own, its own uh, 
identity. It's, it's sort of a different way of doing things than, than any of the other projects that I've mentioned so far. But it's, so far, it's one of the more top-down projects. So, so I think that Free Linux PC is very grassroots, and, and, um, and Free IT Athens is very grassroots. But one of the great things about uh, the, the Gussie Green project is we have a lot of collaborators that are already uh, uh, pretty established and have been able to provide resources to, so that we can get a lot done very quickly. Uh, the first thing is that it's in North Charleston, South Carolina. Do you, has anybody ever visited North Charleston on vacation? Oh, good, excellent, lots of you. Yes, um, North Charleston, uh, South Carolina, uh, for, for uh, population density of about 250,000, it's ranked number 10 for violent crime in the country. So it, it, there, there's a serious poverty problem, and it leads to violent crime in North Charleston, South Carolina. The Chicora Cherokee neighborhood is a particularly bad neighborhood in, in the area. I, I shouldn't have used the word bad, but it's, a, it's certainly an economically challenged. The, the, um, but the, one of the neat things about identifying Chicora Cherokee was Harry Chrissy at Clemson Extension, and I'll talk a little bit more about, about him in a second. Uh, they actually used a, uh, some kind of high-tech GPS thing cross-referencing with a lot of data about about uh, locations and asked a computer, you know, what, what location in South Carolina would be best to start a project like this? And Chicora Cherokee came up like that. They have a median income. Th this neighborhood has a median income of less than $20,000 a year. Their, uh, their grocery store, they had a grocery, neighborhood grocery store closed because of violent crime. Uh, the, the, uh, the, they had a farmer's market so that people could get fresh food after the, the uh, after the, the, the grocery store closed, it's gone now. Uh, the only place for people to buy food in this neighborhood is at the 7-Eleven. That means that there's, uh, they're, they're getting po unnutritious food for hi highly inflated prices. That's why we typically don't buy food at gas stations. But the, uh, the, 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 the point is, is that this is an economically challenged neighborhood that is trying to turn itself around. They're, they're actually working toward toward uh, uh, creating new opportunities in the area. They've had marches against violence, uh, violent crime, all of these things. And so it seemed like an ideal location for, for this, this project, and Harry Chrissy found it. So the North, city of North Charleston actually owns the building, and it's a community center, and, and particularly uh, kids come in a lot uh, to, after school to find things to do. So um, they, the North, North Charleston, city of North Charleston agreed to fund somebody to sit at that lab four nights a week. So they're actually, there's a paid person sitting at the lab if we set it up. So that was the first resource that we had. Um, Comcast business class, or Clemson Extension. So Clemson Extension is uh, uh, part of Clemson University, and Harry Christie works for them. And they are the ones that kind of launched this project. Comcast offered to give us a year of free internet at the location. Right. So, and after a year, they're going to reevaluate the situation. If we're doing what we said that we were going to do, they, they, they were planning to extend it which is great. So, so Comcast is involved, Clemson is involved. The College of Charleston Computer Science, that's, that's uh, where I work, uh, and I'm involved, and the goal here is to get students from the College of Charleston to work on computer literacy materials, to actually get uh, 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 students engaged in the community through their coursework, instead of staying on campus all day, actually working with the community in some sense. And of course, the entire project would not be possible without the Charleston, South Carolina Linux Users Group. And there's lots of folks in the audience right now. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the Charleston Linux Users Group. Uh, that, that's not all of us right there. There's just a, there's just a few of us. But the, but we've really, uh, and I say we, they've really stepped up and 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 taken charge of the of the the technical aspects of the lab and, and really worked hard. They had, we had it up and running in a few, within a few months. Uh, it was ready to go. We're already having classes there. The, uh, all, all the machines are working. The Linux users group is also regularly attending the classes. So Harry Christie of Clemson Extension is developing some course materials, but members of the Linux users group are always at the lab during classes helping out people individually. It's, it's really an amazing thing to see. Um, the, the technical details of the lab, it's just 10 machines running Ubuntu with a central server. The city of North Charleston required us to put filtering software. So we have a central server that's running Dan's Guardian, uh, and, a, and it's also a proxy, so that everything that's uh, coming through there is filtered. There's, there's nothing questionable that people are looking at, and the city of North Charleston's happy. Um, and, of course, the classes. Uh, so Harry Chrissy, and this, you can see Zinko Klocko in the, 
in the picture as well, uh, helping out. The, the, the classes that we're doing right now are typing, uh, resume. We, ha we, did a, we tried an Excel spreadsheet to set up a budget for people. Um, and, and people are learning. They're, they're typing faster than they were when they got there. They're, they're not scared. Like I said, there was a guy that came in the first day. His hands were up like this, and he, he was afraid to touch the keyboard. But he's, uh, he's done, I mean, it's, it's really going well. We're seeing some impact happening. It's still very early. I mean, we have been having classes for about three or four weeks. But it's, it's, going, uh, uh, it's going great. I mean, it's really a great project. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to sort of continue it. So that being said, those are three projects that, that all have very different characteristics, right? The, what we'd like to do is we'd like to see all the local Linux users groups or the, the people that are involved to try to do something like this, if they can, if you have the time and you're interested in the inclination. If you're here, I'm guessing that you have some interest in this. So um, there's, there's a lot of questions that immediately come up that we thought we could just kind of zoom through real quick uh, as far as what it takes to actually get something like this working. Hardware, check your closets. That's, that's, that's an easy, easy way to get started. Right? If you can't get enough, then uh, start calling the local schools and seeing what you can find. Um, uh, Barnwell uh, Elementary in uh, South Carolina has recently got in touch with me and told me that they have about 30 computers that, that, that are just sitting in rooms with nothing to do with them. Right? So, so we have, there's hardware there. The hardware is not hard to find. Financial support. Do you want to talk about Free IT Athens and finances? Uh, sure. Uh, financial support. Don't worry about it. The key is not to raise money. The key is to partner with the groups that already have the resources to help you out. At uh, Free IT Athens, I'm guessing we probably still have a couple thousand dollars in the bank because we do raise some money from the hardware sales and we very rarely spend money. Maybe we'll buy some shelving. Maybe if we're running low on RAM, we'll buy some. But we've really found that you know, for the four years we've been operating, if you can partner with the right groups, run a lab in exchange for space, is how we're getting our space, for instance, then you don't need to worry about the money. The important thing is to focus on getting the volunteers, getting time. That's the resource that matters. Yeah. Administrating an organization like Free IT Athens is a very complex endeavor, although it doesn't sound like it, it would be. Uh, but you have lots of people involved, and people are le constantly leaving, which means that you've got different people that are sort of in charge at different times. I think the key administrative thing that you need to do to get started is to find at least three people that are interested in this project and make decisions unanimously. We didn't have any problem doing that when we started. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the decisions need to be discussed in, 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 in really rational ways. And, 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 you know, it's okay to disagree, but then you've got to make a decision as a group. Right? And, and that's, that, we were able to do that early on. Things changed. We tried different things as time went on. Michael uh, Moore and Michael Luckton left after a few months, and I sort of was left in charge, which uh, I was never completely comfortable with, but I, I, I made do, I think. And the, uh, we tried uh, having different people have different roles, like with different titles, right? We had a volunteer coordinator and all of these other things. That was extremely difficult, right? Because then you get problems with, the, the recycling coordinator has an opinion on how volunteers should be handled, and the volunteer coordinator says something like, what, you're uh, the recycling coordinator. What, what are we, should we listen to? And then when the, the, the things were just made arbitrarily to begin with. So you know, the, these, are, these are the kind of issues that come up in these sort of situations. So it's best to have a flat organization where everybody's got the same say, where uh, maybe three people are making unanimous decisions, uh, but, but everybody is sort of equal. right? And that, that, that makes it easy to get these things launched. Maybe as time goes on, you'll need to change. Uh, Free IT Athens now has how many members are on the board? Fuck. Got, uh, a board of directors with um, five members, and we're trying to make sure there's always at least one really active volunteer on the board, and that we've always got at least one person who's a student at UGA. Right now, we've got a computer science student on the board. Try and make sure that you get a broad range of input. But really, even though we have a board of directors, the board meetings are essentially just staff meetings. Everyone gets together has a list of items they want to talk about. We go around the room and basically reach a consensus on each issue before moving on. And it works, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Uh, the, and the, the, the edu this, of course, there's educational challenges. We do not know how people learn to use computers, right? Especially, if from, we are not from this uh, group that, that hasn't grown up with them. I, I mean, at least I, I'm not, right? I grew up with a computer in the house. So it, it, it's, it's difficult for us to put ourselves in, 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 sho in the shoes of somebody that's never used a computer before. But um, 
But I think that this can be overcome, and we haven't quite figured it out yet, but I'd imagine that if we started partnering with people that know a little bit about education, especially education of impoverished communities, then maybe we could find out something more. This is something we haven't explored yet. I'm hoping to get in touch with some people from some universities and education departments, because I think this is essential. We need to know that what we're doing is, is, has some solid grounding in reality, right? right? That, that, that people actually learn the way that we're trying to teach them. So opportunities. Well, the first opportunity I want to tell you about, because we're quickly running out of time, uh, is that get in touch with us, right? I'm happy, always happy to talk about this stuff. I'm always happy to answer questions about things that I've, I've seen happen, uh, experiences that I've had. Brian would be more than happy as well. Yes. And so uh, get in touch with us. We have this open community technology Google group now, and we hope that you'll, you, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you'll join. We can have, uh, uh, we hopefully have discussions and share experiences. You can tell us about what you're trying to do. We can tell you what we think of that, and, and uh, it's okay. Remember, it's okay to disagree. But uh, I think that, that the important thing is that we, we become engaged in this conversation as open source advocates. Um, educational institutions, there's a massive opportunity right now because there's a huge move in higher education towards service learning, right? UGA, for instance, has an Office of Service Learning. College of Charleston has one. I mean, they're, they're everywhere. So what you can do is you can get in touch through, uh, if, if you don't know any faculty members at, at a university, call this Office of Service Learning. Say, this is what I want to do. Do you have students that might be interested in this? If you get students, they've got a lot of energy, right? Students have energy. Get, get them out there and get them working in the community with you. Uh, so, yeah, I'm getting the two-minute sign. So uh, planned projects, Columbia, Columbia Lug. Is, is, is planning to try something like Gussie Green. I'm really excited that, that it's spreading. So if you give them a hand. We wish you the best of luck. Uh, uh, I'm hoping that, uh, uh, that, it, that, it, that they can learn a little bit from our experiences and that we hope it works. Uh, we're looking at working in Allendale, South Carolina, which is another very rural area, but it's a rural area with inner city problems. It's a, uh, but we're, we're, that's what we're gonna, planning to do with the, barn, the machines we get from Barnwell. Um, there's, you can always sell your recycled stuff if people are donating old computers. You can always sell them for scrap to recycling companies. Free IT had a lot of success with that. Not only can you sell it to them, they will come out and pick it up at their own expense. Recycling electronics is a highly lucrative business, right? They will drive, for, for Athens, they drive from Atlanta, they would bring people up, they would move everything themselves. Like, when I was there, we, we recycled about two tons of material that way, with just storing it and then letting them come and pick it up. They paid us like four cents a pound or something like that. We can put you in touch with recycling companies that will do that for you. Um, do it responsibly. Oh, do it responsibly, right. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're keeping them out of landfills. They're not doing anything uh, that they shouldn't be doing with the hardware. Um, and we're providing the tools like the wiki on free Linux PC and stuff like that. So use these things, right? And uh, last but not least is some website addresses if you're interested. Uh, but feel free to ask questions. Feel free to talk to us. We're uh, happy to, to answer anything, and we appreciate you coming and, and listening. So thanks. Thanks. This work was recorded by View Digital Media and is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike version 3.0. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit southeastlinuxfest.org.